Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Sandy Vershaw, and I'm the chair of the Rata Centre, and it's my great pleasure tonight to uh, join the panel. And we're going to do a session on creating readers. So, the topic tonight we're going to discuss is how do successful writers find readers and engage with audiences? Can likes, tweets, blog posts, and performances translate into sales? How important are readings, festivals, and appearances? And our panel are going to talk about navigating their way through the business of connecting with readers. Um, and from my left is Zoe Ferraris. Uh, Zoe's born in the USA. Um, she moved to Jeddah in Saudi Arabia in the aftermath of the first Gulf War and lived in a conservative Muslim community with her then husband and his family, a group of Saudi Palestinians, and has written a series of fantastic books um, that are based in Saudi Arabia. So I hope some of you have written, and if not, there's always a chance because writer's week's on for a few more days. <laughs> um, Sean Williams. Um, Sean is the number one New York Times best-selling author and has been called the premier Australian speculative fiction writer of the age in quite... Controversial <laughs> statement. Yeah, for the diversity of his output, which spans fantasy, science fiction, horror, and even the odd poem. So he's published 35 novels oh. and 75 short stories, <laughs> which is nothing short of cruel. Yeah. <laughs> and here we have D.W. Wilson, a Davis <clears throat> Canadian short story writer and novelist, uh, born and raised in British Columbia, and his stories have appeared in literary magazines across Canada, Ireland, and the United Kingdom. And The Dead Roads won the uh, BBC National Short Story Award in 2011. So, if I can welcome our panel. I do also have to thank our sponsors, which is the Adelaide Writers Week and the Australian Council. <coughs> so, um, we, we actually had this very funny conversation a few minutes ago when I actually said, So, how do you, you know, how do you do Facebook, Twitter, blogs, video, YouTube? How do you connect with your readers and how do you find followers? And, and David said, I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not certain that I'm the right guy to be on this panel. Oh, yes, but you, then, you did, then you talked about a whole lot of other stuff there. No. Um, I joined Twitter like two weeks ago because, of, basically, because a friend of mine slash arch five of mine got a commission to write an article for L via Twitter. She paid a dollar a word. I was like, oh shit! I guess I'll join Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. That you know, two years. My publisher trying to trying to get me to join it. And that, that's what broke me. And does the offer come through yet? Yeah, no, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Like, come on, L. Come on. <laughs> um, sure. Well, I'm in a similar kind of camp. When Sarah asked me to be involved in this, I said, well, you know, I'm not sure that any of this kind of really helps, but I, I do do a lot of it. I mean, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, I go to conventions, I go to festivals, I believe in engaging with the community, but I'm not sure how to measure the effects of it. Uh, I do it because I enjoy it. But I think that at the end of the day, I aim to build my audience by writing better books. So. Um, I do a lot of it, but um, it comes and goes in cycles, and the first thing that when we discovered what this panel was about, our first subject that came up was like, we need more time to write, and doing publicity is the number one thing that takes away from that time to write, and so I've definitely discovered that, um, and it's invasive, like doing a publicity event like this where you go to Australia and it's this big week and you just <laughs> set this mental time aside. But, you know, Twitter and Facebook is like all day, every day, the potential exists to have this pressure on you to be away from your writing. And, and so, but yes, I do. Can I just ask, how many, how many of you are actually writers? Some, quite I think that's a comprehensive no, that's good, because we were just talking about that before, <laughs> whether, you know, how that affects you. So, okay, so then my question is, how do you connect with your readers? If, if you haven't got, you know, a... a, a blog or of a, a, a social media following, which seems to be, you know, the big thing that people are trying to create, and that's probably why you've got pressure from the publicist. Mm -hmm. So how are you actually connecting with readers? I mean, there's, I mean, these festivals that you, you do, usually you, when you publish a book, you go on like a year-long tour of going around to a festival here and there, you know, so I, I ended up going back to Canada, doing the five cities there, Toronto, Ottawa, Vancouver, Calgary, Banff, and then, um, and then around the UK to a bunch of shitty little festivals. And then this is the first time I've ever had to come to, to Australia, and it's been amazing. And I, I think that just face-to-face -face is, is the only way that I've ever been able to, to actually connect with, 
with their readership. Um, the occasional event, like literary event, somewhere that someone is fond, their death match, for example. Um, but I also, like, I'm not uncontactable. Uh, like, I have a website that directs you to my agent's website, which you can then go by my agent and they'll forward the email to me. And I always, I always respond to any emails I get from, from people who make that effort to do so. Um, but, that, but as far as like, you know, my Facebook account is, is just a private account with my friends. I'm unsearchable. Um, and I, I have just joined Twitter. And I, you know, I think I've, got, I've got like 60 followers or something like that, which I, I don't even, I barely know what that means. I know that, I think that means that when I po post something, 60 people see it. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah okay. What's your name as well? I'll give you a retweet. It's, oh, it's, it's at Redneck Abroad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you have millions of followers, but I think that's why you find me on 60 followers. <laughs> <laughs> Redneck Abroad. Yeah. Um, what about you, Sean? I, what was the question? Sorry. In terms of how do you connect with your readers, like uh, what do you think is the, is the way that you connect nicely with your readers? Well, I'm not sure there is one way. I mean, I do a little bit of everything. And, uh, and, and partly it's an experiment. I like to kind of challenge myself in a safe sort of way to experiment with Twitter or, or go to a festival where I know I'll be looked after and where I might meet a bunch of strangers in a safe environment. Uh, and I... And I don't know what's effective because it's very hard to quantify this. You know, somebody buys a book, you, you look at your book sales and you don't know whether that came from reviews or from a, a panel talk. But you do occasionally hear from readers who say, five years ago I saw you at Adelaide Writers Week and I bought your book and since then I bought all your books or, or on Facebook the other day. I mean, I, I've been doing a lot of this just lately. I've, 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 just, I've discovered Hootsuite so you can, you can schedule posts like weeks in advance. So I've been posting a quote from my latest book every day to Facebook and Twitter, and I've been thinking, surely this is tedious for everybody on my feeds. But someone eventually said, I'm going to have to buy this book. And I thought, well, that's great. I've got one sale. But, yeah. but that was from somebody I've known for 30 years. So maybe I finally <laughs> broke into the barrier. So, so I don't know whether it has any effect at all. But I know that if I didn't do it, I wouldn't have that one sale. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Unless they just said that, hoping you'd shut up. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I know. Yeah. But, you know, I don't know. What day is Um Number one way I connect with readers is at events, like uh, reading, a library reading or a bookstore or whatever. But um, it's always an awkward and strange thing to connect with a reader. I mean, they're just like, in the olden days, people picked up a book and they read it and they were like, wow, this is a great book. And like, the author was kind of not in the equation. Like, I don't... The author's name dictated where it was in the library, so, so yeah, you knew to go, and that's that all. And yeah. like, and now you're supposed to be a personality, and I think most writers instantly just yeah. avoid that, and that's why they're writers. So <laughs> you're in a sort of an awkward situation, and so um, I think there's a huge pressure on on me and on other writers all the time, and and so I'm supposed to be meeting people all the time on social media, and I'm supposed to be emailing and ah all this stuff, but. Uh, to really connect is sort of in the old-fashioned way, face to face with people, and I've actually made good friends out of you know meeting someone at a reading, and then they come to another one, and before you know it, we have something else in common, and we're taking long walks in certain parts of the city, and they're just there. That's a, a way of a natural friendship to develop, and that that to me is connecting to a reader. But then you have that thing where it's like a friend, and then it becomes a friend. So in terms of just straight publicity. Um, I actually think writers do more damage at, on Twitter and Facebook than successfully like sell their books, and it's just because the big danger of those things is narcissism and being boring. And you know, and I follow writers, and and I'm like, oh my god, again, this person's tweeting about you know crime and oh, murder and whatever, you know. And it's like you start to they're either their feed is all about their books and uh, the subject, so they're just purely professional about it and then you're you know there's no kind of personality that you sort of expect from Twitter or Facebook and then or they're like all personality but it's like the stuff they're eating for breakfast and the yeah. it's too personal I mean there are writers I'm friends with on Facebook who I know everything their children say <laughs> you know, I've never met them like um, so it's really you're navigating some huge space that 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 you're just there's so many pitfalls and and I really think that to, to successfully do it, you have to sort of do what you do in any publicity event, which is just convince somebody that you are worth listening to or that you are the person who had to write this book. And, like, information today is so cheap. Like, you can go online and find out anything that I've written in any of my books, but I'm, 
um, my job in a publicity event is to convince you that I've put it together in a way I've thought about it enough and I have enough passion or whatever um, to make you want to read the way I've presented it and the way I've done it or you know just the facts that I've accumulated from personal experience and and so that same responsibility translates into Twitter and Facebook I think you know to, to continue that uh, and that's what I think publishers really want but they don't they don't quite know how to tell you that and just like how do you connect with the readers to convince them a reader not another writer just somebody who might read your book and those people I don't know that they're generally going to follow you on Twitter like the people who follow me have already read my book mm. and then they yes, go look for me on Twitter and you know and if they follow you that means they probably liked your book and that's the best way to get somebody to buy your next book is that they liked your previous book and so you, they're already, it's already a guaranteed kind of audience and, uh, yes this is it's, good it's, point how do you get those people to follow you if they've never heard of you before it's, it's right. Right. so your followers Sean on Facebook and I, I follow Sean on Facebook I don't stalk him I just don't follow him <laughs> and so I see your feeds coming through every now and then um, are, are they uh, what, what's the sort of balance between those that are actually friends, people that you've met through university or through writing or whatever, and those that actually are people that you didn't know beforehand? I think the majority of my followers are the people that I don't know. But they're, they're my, so I'll basically friend anybody who doesn't look like a crazy person. So, uh, and I've only defriended like one person in my entire career and that was my sister <laughs> so, oh. so I, I'm, I'm pretty tolerant when it comes to that and I do use it as a publicity tool but I'm also fairly open about my personal life in some ways so my my Facebook feed is a mix, mixture of professional stuff and crazy personal stuff in fact the best thing I ever did for publicity and this wasn't intentional was um, uh, my son's family uh, his extended family went overseas for six, six months and his young sister half sister had two green tree frogs that needed someone to mind, look after them for six months. So I volunteered, and I and because I knew she'd miss the frogs, I put a photo of the frog on my Facebook page for her to look at in Europe. And my number of Facebook followers and hits on my Facebook page went through the roof because, had a lot of because people were following the frogs. So and yeah. and you know, friends of mine like Garth Nix were saying, all you've got to do is get a photo of the frog on your next book, and your sales will skyrocket. But I'm not going to do that because that's really, you know, a bit venal. But uh, but that that mixture of sort of an engaging personal life with an interesting professional life is the mix you're going for, I guess, to yeah. keep people interested, whether they're friends or strangers. But So, David, given that you've only just started, did the 60 people that are following you on Twitter, are they 60 people that you know? Most of them are people that I know, either personally or professionally. I think I've had a few people who have, like, since I've been at the festival, I've been tweeting about the festival. Yeah. I think, I you know, hashtag ADLWW. Yeah. And I think that, I, that if, I think I've got some followers who have, who have thought that what I've gone on that was funny. I wrestled David Pan in the lobby of the hotel room. <laughs> and, that, and that, I saw, saw a sudden surge of followers after I did that. Yeah. Um, but that's mostly because I put hashtag David Van on there, right? Mm. Um, so yeah. And so I, then I, they come back and say what... Well, because David Van is famous, right? So they were like, oh, David Van wrestling, some dude, I don't know, follow him. Okay. I think. So yeah. this is I've a great way it. to get new readers, is through other writers. Yeah. So yeah. You yeah. can become friends with Scott Westerfield or J.K. Rowling or whatever, and if they retweet something by you, yeah. you can get a surge of tweets. Margaret Atwood will retweet anything readers, to be That's the question. You might get a lot of followers, but does it translate yes. to readers? So, David, you spoke a minute ago about your agent and their role. And mm -hmm. so, so where does... Where, you obviously try and keep fairly private, but how do you use the role of your publisher or your publicist in, in, well, I mean, in that I, engagement process. Ideally, they do all of it for me. I, I, I you know, I, my job is to write the book. Um, I'll write articles if they, if they, if the, if the uh, publication that they pitch me to is willing to pay me. I won't write an article for free, not anymore. I've done enough of that. Exposure is something you can die from. Um, and uh, and then my agent, same thing. My, you know, my she she handles all the professional, like all the other like magical bullshit element of it that I don't know a thing about. And I basically will do what she says. She says, I think that you should take this contract or this, and, and I just go, okay, I trust you. Um, I really try and just, my, my job is to write the book. I know it's really old fashioned. Um, so far, it's sort of worked. I will, I mean, I go to events, my publicists schedule events for me, and I go to those, I don't mind it. But I, but I as far as like, kind of like, you know, like throwing myself out to the masses and, and like, and like trying to charm people, it's not, I'm not, it's not, I don't do it naturally. Um, and I do keep that my my private life private. Uh, I have a I have a you know I a brand. I mean writers have brands now, 
I, you know, I mean, I've been in England. I'm this redneck in England. So my when I when I'm abroad, when I'm out in in, in England, you know, I'm I wear plaid on purpose. I wear ball cap on purpose. You know, it's I, I, it's, it's a facade to try and create this 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 writer who is this thing. I mean, I mean, comparatively, you know, I am more of an outdoors guy than people in England. I mean, I'm the king of the wild frontier in England. But in Canada, I'm a, I'm, I'm a city boy, yeah. right? You know, I, I, I grew up in the middle of nowhere, but I, my formative years were in a city. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing a PhD for fuck's sake, right? It's not, it's, it's, I'm not some like bear wrestling idiot, but that, but that is sort of the, sort of like the, the, the brand that, I, that I've ended up sort of unintentionally um, with, like having in England. But, but you're following that brand. Are you well, following that brand because that translates to the readers that you're trying to get to, or are you following that brand because you because it, I mean, basically just because it sort of worked. I I, 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 I this isn't I haven't been so tactical about this. Like yeah. I, I mean I just yeah. and you know it's 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 easy and comfortable for me to put that version of me out rather than to, than to expose myself to people who who as 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 I am right. Like there's like, like a, a little known fact is that is that I like video games. But I don't let readers know that. That's that's my personal life. I don't want I don't want that out. Although I think it says nerd on my Twitter thing. I think it says it says redneck nerd author. Um, but it's, it's it is it's it, that that is probably the most like the most active I am in in promoting my own stuff is is with that brand. And that came up after after I did my MFA my MA in, in Norwich. I had a class and one of my teachers talked about this brand that. You, that that all writers end up having these days, yeah. and, and you know, and I, and I was sort of you know, you know, making fun of English people, and there was like this banter we had going about this, this Canadian guy who's among us, and that sort of just ended up being like what I rolled with. I mean, not not like I say, not like I was just like like being like tactical or really like aha, it just yeah. happened, yeah. and now it's a way for me to just to shield like my actual personal life from my professional life, because when those spill over, it's just I don't know, that way lies madness. Yeah. What about you, Zoe? Did, has your publisher or your publicist sort of spent a bit of time trying to create a brand, a brand Zoe? Um, actually, no. In fact, so I wrote my first novel set in Saudi Arabia, and then I wanted to write a second one, and my publisher said, "No, you're going to get branded." They're, they were like, you know, very conscious of pigeonholing, and um, and I. I I think that was a good instinct. I ended up wanting to finish this trilogy that I wrote, and I did that anyway. And I do feel though that I. Um, it has pigeonholed me, but not in terms of my writing, just in terms of a public, you know, facade. Um, the interesting thing about your publicity experience is I, my impression is that that's unusual. That's kind of what a publisher does when they're super into an author. They'll give you all this attention and book tour and stuff. And like most authors that are, especially first time authors, they, they kind of just, um, they tell you to do it yourself, you know. And they'll they'll just kind of throw everything at you. Your publicist might arrange a couple things, but like the majority of authors are somewhere in this middle zone where they're like, you know, the number one thing they're going to tell you to do is like online stuff, you know, because yeah. they don't want to pay for you to go to book tour, and they don't want to pay to do a whole ton of publicity for you, um, and they don't they can't ask you to do that because you'd have to pay for it yourself, and they there's sort of inappropriateness about that. But see, that's bullshit because I mean you're making them money. That, that's bullshit. It's it's completely disgusting. I mean, I, my, I'm in agreement with that, but it's sort of like the truth about publishing, at least in America. And I don't actually know if it's that different in Australia. So my yeah, okay, different in Australia. Uh, oh yeah, no, I, I, I do a bit of touring in Australia, but I, but I'm not often toured overseas. And I have actually paid. I pay for myself to go around the world once a year uh, to go to events and to meet with editors and stuff like that. And I, I treat it as an investment in my business and and in general, it's a I get good returns from it, so uh, I don't know whether it comes in terms of sales to the audience, but I certainly sell to editors that I like and get on well with because I'm often there in New York and often there in London. So, so in that sense, it's it's good for. No, it's but that's a different that's a different side of thing. That's yeah. kind of marketing to an editor rather yeah. than marketing to a reader, yeah. and hopefully then that flows on through to to readers. But, um, so, is there a brand, Sean? Well, see, I don't know because I write kids and adult books and young adult books and science fiction and fantasy and Star Wars novels and dad poetry. So, you know, brand Sean is that there is no... You don't know what you're going to get when you pick up a Sean Williams novel until you read the back of the book. So, so I think in that sense I've kind of defied marketing deliberately and perhaps so defeatingly. <laughs> but, but what Zoe said about not wanting to be branded into a... Like, into a, kind of a, like doing your three books, that, that's different. From, like, like you don't, I don't want to give branded or pigeonholed into writing like 
fiction set in Intermere about sad men. Right, there's a, I mean, there's, a, there's a distinction between the work and then the author, right? Authors have to be personalities in this day and age. Right. We can be. I think that the, the, a, good, a good persona, a good brand is a reflection of the person and you, you do what you're comfortable with. And if it's successful, then that means you're reaching the right audience for your book. And I think that's a really important question that any author at any stage in their career has to ask themselves, you know, what is the audience I'm trying to reach? Are, the, are they Twitter savvy? Are they rednecks? Are they... Are they kids aged between 12 and 15? Are they the over 60s? And if you're marketing to the wrong group, it doesn't matter what you do. You're I mean, let's be honest, they're, they're middle-aged women. Yeah, sure. That's what it is. Yeah. And they're going to respond well to the festival. You mean for yeah. you or for your... For most readers. For, for most all readers. readers. Not all. I mean, I don't, well, maybe do you, for kids writing. I get Star Wars, I think they love, they love that. <laughs> well, all the old ladies have grandkids. Yeah, that's true. That's true. true. Exactly. So, so um, I mean, I know quite a few authors who, and this is a while ago, but if they wanted to write in a different genre, then their publishers would ask them to have a different name. Yeah. 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 I've been so, trying to use this pseudonym for 15 years and they won't let me because... Because you're a brand. Because, you're I, a brand. because you're I'm a number one New York Times bestselling <coughs> author under Sean Williams and if I change my name to Joe Bloggs, they can't say that anymore. Yeah. 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 But they could say, here's this new author who's fantastic and exciting. But they oh, won't let me. Yeah. Because I wonder whether that was sort of the pressure on you from your publisher if you do those three, which is a trilogy, which is fantastic. But I, I know from speaking to you the other day that the next thing that you do is going to be something quite different. Yeah. But whether there's any pressure on you to change your brand, adapt the way you're talking to readers or... Yeah, I mean, it's definitely in the mentality of the publisher. Like, I, I wrote these three books and then I, I wrote a children's series. I'm in the middle of it right now. And literally every publisher that I've dealt with, all my publishers for all those books say the same things to me they're like um well you can reach out to your existing audience and tell them to buy it for their grandchildren <laughs> and it's like well, you know this is just like as a writer you're coming up against a kind of a force field there um and there's another there's another fact of that which is that uh, a lot of the connections I had to start all over with the children's series like I had to find a brand new agent a brand new publisher I had to wait I got rejected for a year I mean it was like Having your foot in the door, it doesn't really mean anything. It didn't in this case. Uh, it was just a completely different novel and a completely different style and everything. And I think there was even a little bit of like unwillingness on the part of my existing connections. They just they think of it as like a bad, um, like it's going to interfere with what they're trying to build, which is the brand, the idea of a yes, brand, yes. an adult author. Yeah. Did you have problems changing genres? Sean, or no. you've been doing it so long you can't remember? Uh, no, and I don't I, mean that facetiously, but you were actually because you were doing Star Wars while you were writing other stuff. And yeah, I moved from science fiction to fantasy very yeah, early in my yeah. career, and, and my publisher didn't have a problem with that. Yeah. I, I don't know why. I, maybe they should have had a problem with it. I, I'm not sure. What about you, David? What sort of genres do you think? A uh, short story novel. Yeah, you, would you look at writing? In? I mean, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't. It's, I, I have no reason. Like, I have nothing against it. I just. Think that, I, that those aren't the kind of books I want to write. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, it's possible, and I, and I would probably use a pseudonym, a pseudonym, if I did. Um, but I mean, I, I just think I, I, there, I, have, I have too many stories I want to tell in in, in, in lit fiction that that even, even though I would make a lot more money probably doing something else. Romance. Yeah, that's the best version. <laughs> Softcore <laughs> pornography. Let's just do it. Uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I was going to say you're with the same publisher through all of your books. I, uh, at that time, I had 25 novels published by HarperCollins here in Australia. And, uh, wow. I think yeah. partly because I was producing... Why am I even here? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> because different experiences, you know, different people have different experiences. And, and with me, because I was prolific, I could produce a science fiction novel a year and a fantasy novel a year. So, in that sense, the careers kind of ran parallel. If I'd been producing a science fiction novel, and then two years later a fantasy novel, and then two years later a science fiction novel, they might have been a little bit more freaked out about it, because you've got to... But, yeah, you know, there's no the continuity in the genre, uh, and Star Wars then was happening with a different publisher off to the side, and so that's a whole different thing. So, and David, you were saying earlier that you you don't um, even look to see what your sales are. Yeah, yeah, no, like no, that. no, no, no. And do you read your reviews? <laughs> I shouldn't. Okay, <laughs> Sean, you read yours? Uh, I'll glance at them. 
and if they seem <laughs> all right, then, then I'll read them. If they're not, I then I won't look at them. No matter what happens, like either you get a super ego boost and you're a dickhead for a day, yeah. or, or you or you like or like you just lie down on the ground thinking that everything is fucked and your wife has to drag you out the door and feed you. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so there's no, there's, yeah, and they just eat. I think the reviews. There's no good reason to read your reviews. There's none. Well, there is for publicity reason. I think that that's the one reason why I read reviews is because there might be a, a quotable quote, there might be a tweetable tweet, there might be something. Isn't that what your publicist is for? Yeah, they do that too. But I, I do it. I okay. pay more attention to it than I they do usually. So. What about you, Sally? Um, I do read them. I get like they get sent to me by my publisher. Yeah, where does like, that? It's sort of unavoidable, but. The if you mean like the reviews that people leave on like Amazon or yeah. online websites, no, that's no. a little different. I kind of um, those are the ones I feel like you shouldn't read. No, like. you should never read below the bottom of the page on any internet page. No, no matter what, reads. Don't, don't, read don't read the comment yeah. section. <laughs> I totally read them because so, I think so they're really interesting. I'm so like, oh, that's totally that is if you're not gonna if you don't read them. That's Word of mouth, I think. Word of mouth, but you know. Well, but, I mean, so you've got sorry. no comeback. You've got no. I mean, I, I don't need. I don't need to feedback from my readers. I mean, that's not. I'm not at really, realistically, they're not the writers. They're not. I mean, I barely take feedback from my editor. You know, I, I, mean, I, I stare at those sentences for four years. And, you know, I don't need to hear some guy come up and say your your sentences could use could more IMGs. It's like get out of here. <laughs> no, so I, there's no. There, there's no. There, they have no use. They have no use to writers. Like, like the publicity, sure. For up to, for other readers, sure. But you know, readers are it's great to see. Uh, uh, you know, readers want to know what this book is about. It's a good book. Good reason is great for that. Amazon um, review is probably great for that. But I mean, there's no, it's no use for me. Even if it's positive, if it's positive. I don't, you know, it's it's, it's great. Sure, you get a, you know, you get a nice feeling in your tummy. But uh, you know, it's, which is great, actually. I mean, I, I will say, like, when you're in isolation for so long, just in terms of working on a project and never having any feedback on it, or you know, it's really nice to have that experience. So. Just on the other side of that, like you can go to Goodreads and be like, "Oh yeah, man, somebody liked it, someone read it, they got it. Oh my god, like it's just so." And then you get that one that. star review, and you're like, yeah, that's and "You're like, oh yeah, that person doesn't know what they're talking about. They can't even spell. You know, <laughs> you just find ways to like, you know, protect yourself." No, but it's true. It's really, really affirming to read reviews below, you know, the bottom of the page. But yeah, there's a danger in it. I would agree. I want to know that people are writing the reviews and are talking about the book, and I think you want to hit that critical mass for your readers create the new readers for you and then that happens on Goodreads that happens because I'm writing a lot in YA at the moment the blogging the blogosphere is so important you know if your book's not popping up in various blogs it'll possibly vanish without trace and and of course they will tweet their reviews and tag you in the tweet so you go oh great somebody's read my book and it's a did not finish or a one star and you go why did you send that to me you ruined my day you know but at least it's good to know that somebody's still talking about it you know, there's that line, there's no such thing as bad publicity. And in a way, that's kind of true with books. You know, even if it's a bad review, someone may still buy it. But, uh, so if somebody did tweet and they've you know, put a hashtag so it's come through on your fake, do you actually respond? Uh, I won't respond if it's a bad review, but I'll, I'll usually say thanks for reviewing or glad you like the book. Or, okay. But I, I would never argue with somebody. Because yeah. that would be for someone that didn't like you and yeah. they, they said, oh, you know, I love this book, you know, blah, 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 hashtag. And you respond, go thanks, thanks for the review. That would be gold for that person because it's you know, don't you think? Well, yeah. blogging is oh, blogging is hard work. Gold for me. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, blogging's really hard work, and that and that 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 stroke back from the author saying, I've seen your work, and thanks very much for it, is is kind of, in a way, what they're doing it for. You know, we're, we're in a way, in a sense, we're writing to get attention from our readers, but they're also reviewing and blogging to get attention from, from their readers. Yeah. And, that includes us when they drag us into it. Because one of the things, I mean, you know, there's, I mean, most organisations, most brands, most whatever, are, are spending enormous amounts of energy trying to actually crank up their social media presence or their online presence. And that is the way that everybody's sort of being pushed that, you know, you have to have a Twitter feed, you have to have a blog, you have to have a website page, you know, you should be posting on YouTube at this point, and, you know, it's sort of Facebook, etc. But that must... Again, as a writer, that would take an extraordinary amount of your time away from actually what you do, surely. Yeah. So how do you how do you manage that tension between what the expectation is and you were saying you know, you've been pushed by your publisher or your publicist for a long time to try and yeah. get on Twitter and, and trying to go, Well no, I'm I'm doing this bit over here. 
If you don't enjoy it, you shouldn't do it. I don't uh, think, it should be know. fun. I mean, I really think you should make it fun for yourself. My husband used to do, he worked for Netflix, this uh, video service, and like they had so many rules. And it was just Twitter work. That's all he did was tweet with people all day as customer service. And like, and there were just like a million things you were not allowed to say. And a writer has a total opposite experience. You can be totally nimble. And you're, you know, there's the threat your publisher may come after you and say, what the hell did you just do? But <laughs> you, uh, you should have like a uh, certain enjoyment in that like freedom that you can just like, you can connect immediately with somebody and just go out there and have fun. I think that's the most important thing because if you're not having fun, I mean, there's so many authors on Twitter who just are tweeting like, almost like robotically, you know, like, oh, look, here's an article about the subject of my book, and here's a da-da-da. There's no personality in it, there's no fun in it, there's no connectivity. I really think you have to put yourself in that, you know, if you're going to do it. I mean, yesterday I, I tweeted about chocolate. Today I tweeted a bad haiku. Um, I criticised Christians during the Great Debate. Uh, and these are all things that I feel very passionate about, you know, and they're not always entertaining or interesting, they're not always retweeted, but they're they me expressing myself by this particular... I mean, none, none of that's going to go in a novel. It's just me wanting to yeah. shout out into the void yeah, and yeah, maybe yeah. someone will like it, maybe yeah. someone won't. And, uh, you know, I kind of enjoy it. I've got, I've got a few more questions, but I'm interested as to what you were hoping to find out from these wonderful people in this panel tonight. Do you have questions of them? Yeah, I'm interested. I've talked a lot about post-publication creating readers. Mm. What about <laughs> before publication? So things like writing with your readers in mind and also is it worth developing a following before you're even at that publication stage? And if so, how? That's, I think, what publishers wet dream. It's like, oh my God, they've got a million followers already. Like that, That's appealing to a publisher. Um, I think, though, it's like the writer's perpetual dilemma in a way, like especially a first novel. Like, who are you writing this? Like, who's your audience, you know? It's really tricky... I think publishers have learned now that having a million followers doesn't translate to a million book sales. Mm. Uh, and, and busting your gut trying to get a million followers may get in the way of writing a good book. You know, the, I think ultimately it always comes back to write the best book you possibly can. Yeah, I, uh, I agree. I don't think. I mean, I don't think you should even worry about your audience. If you're on doing your first book, you should be writing the best first book you can. For you, yeah, hundred mm. percent. Yes, I'm sad I missed that too. Yeah. Just imagine, right here, right now, the internet does not exist. No Twitter, no Facebook, no connecting through the internet. How, That's how I started. How would you, or do you have any other ways or skills and recommendations for connecting with readers? Well, my first book came out in 1994. So the internet existed, but there was no World Wide Web. Uh, I think that's correct. Or if there was a World Wide Web, it was, it was very, very marginal. Yeah. I remember it used to take me minutes to upload and to drag down my emails from the four people. You I didn't have those. emails in 94? I, I, yeah, I think I did. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, think, I think we did. Yeah. 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 We were like five. <laughs> uh, and, and, and books sold. Books sold. And they sold the traditional way. They, they, people became aware of them through bookshops, they became aware of them through newspapers, they became aware of them through uh, newsletters and magazines and I mean word of, mouth, word of mouth existed back then just in different ways you know you had because I was writing in the science fiction community there were zines and fanzines and magazines designed to connect readers to new work. It was traditionally totally the publisher's job to do that. And um, if they needed you for something, they called you. And it sounds like that's your kind of your attitude toward a publisher. Yeah. Like, yeah. They do take 99%. You know, yeah, your they, royalty seriously. rate is going to be like 5 to 10%. They're taking the lion's share of the profit of everything. And they should be doing all of that work. And um, I think the traditional, there's parallels in the modern world, like with the internet, to all the traditional stuff. Like a zine was like, what's a blog today almost? Or... Like place people go when they want something that they know they love, and this might be interesting for them. It's uh, it's kind of just a continuation of the same thing, I think. But publishers don't do as much of it. The responsibility, yeah, my experience, uh, comes to you as the author. Take on this role that really, do we have to be our own publicity machine? I haven't found that though. You like don't have I, to be. Yeah, no. I mean, I so we're having opposite experiences here. Yeah. Like he's totally like in connection with his publicist. Um, having like relying on them for everything they're screening stuff for you you know like yeah i'm totally the opposite like my 
publisher barely does. I send them an email once every six to eight months telling them everything I've done <laughs> and oh. asking if they would mind reimbursing me for any part of it. And they're usually like, they pretend they never got the email or they're like, oh no, we don't do that, you know. Um, so, and I think that from my talking to people, my experience is not that abnormal. It's actually kind of the norm. And yeah. truly what that is, is publishers, this is how they've embraced the modern world. You can do all this stuff yourself. So a lot of writers, at least in America, they're like, well, why do we need a publisher? You know? I wonder if that is the key difference here, is that you're published in America and I'm published in Canada and England. Hmm. No, I think it depends on where you fit into the ecosphere operating within the publisher and inside the zeitgeist. You know, I think uh, if, if the publisher thinks your book is amazing and uh, and it seems like a book that will strike a fire or, or the publishing director likes you or any number of variables that are beyond your control, they might decide to invest, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars in flying you around the world, or, uh, or, or ten thousand dollars in something, or, or nothing. And it doesn't necessarily mean they don't believe in your book, or they don't believe in you as a writer. It's just that at this particular time, this particular meme is something that might take off, and it's not something you might get permanently. I mean, I've, some of my books have got this kind of treatment. Most of my books haven't, with the same publisher at different times. And I think it's it's a bit of a crapshoot. It's a bit of a it's a bit of a roll of the dice, and and whether your book does well or not has nothing to do with how much yeah, they've invested in your publicity, which is the crazy making thing. Yeah, right? nobody it's, knows why books sell. That's right, and you can do absolutely nothing publicity wise to direct connect with your readers, and your book can explode. You can spend thousands of dollars bringing yourself around the world, and thousands of hours investing in blogging and websites and cover reviews and all this kind of stuff, and make no connection at all. It's it's yeah. completely out of our control. And that's why we should only do it if we enjoy it. Think. Or they're paying like, us for it. Or they're paying us for it. Uh, and even <laughs> then, well, if you don't want to do it, I mean, yeah. a bit of if you don't like it, if you don't like it, even if they're paying, for depends it, how much they're paying. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but as a writer, as a as a writer, one of the things that you you must be trying to do is in some way connect with your reader, other than you know understanding that they will go and buy your book or get it from the library or however. So, what are the things that are within your control that you enjoy doing that actually takes you? into that proximity of a reader or connecting with someone? I don't think that it is my job to, for me to connect with a reader. I think it's, it's the, the book's job to connect with a reader. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy to engage in a conversation if, if a reader goes to the effort to contact me. But I don't see why, like, me, the author, like, how does, that, how does me affect a reader's enjoyment or not enjoyment of a book? The book, you know, the meaning exists between reader and text. I mean, me out there, that's nothing. It doesn't matter. And I, and I don't feel any obligation to do that. I'm happy to. I do enjoy talking to people when, 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 when I have the opportunity, but I don't feel I have to go out of my way to connect with readers. And I, it, like, that's this thing's purpose. So why are you doing writer's circuits? Because it's fun. Because Be it's fun? Okay. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm serious. I, I don't mean that to be rude. No, and, like, and, and, that, and, 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 and I, don't mind, I, I don't mind doing it, but you know, I'm pitching the book, right? I'm pitching yeah. the, the book. And and I don't see I don't know I don't see why I have so, to. So yeah, so you're pitching the book and not you. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm just really interested in it because it's sort of part of that thing is that connection. It's like you know, um, uh, as a reader, as a reader to actually meet or hear or see or get some sort of connection with the the writer mm -hmm. of something that you've really loved, particularly if you've read the book and you've really loved it. It's quite special. It's very, very special when you actually get that connection. You get to meet the person that wrote the book. Like, you know, that's yeah, I feel like that. there's the before and the after. There's the yeah. person who hasn't read your book and yeah. the idea of connecting to them, and that's a publishing problem. Like, you know, I and agree with yeah, that. That's the one I'm and then there's the, the one after, the someone who's yeah. read your book, and they usually make an effort to contact you, and that is sort of natural. That just happens. We have something to talk about. They've read the book. The interest in them is there. They might ask you some more questions. questions and they want yeah. to come back. That's so, completely... So the first one where you're creating a reader. Right. So where, what's... You don't think that's your role? But also, if, if, if someone buys my book because they laughed at a joke I made or something, then, I mean, the odds of them actually liking the book are slim. <laughs> right? Like, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, it's, it's, not a, it's not a funny book. I try to be pretty funny. If they're like, that guy's funny, I'm going to read his book, they're going to be like, oh my god. <laughs> you know, like, it's, like I, I, agree with, I agree with Zoe that you know, I, if I'm happy to engage in a conversation with readers if, if, if they want that, but I don't, but I don't 
like the, my purpose as a writer is, is to write the book. Yeah. That is that is that's literally my job description. And and, and and beyond that, that's I enjoy it. I'll do it, but it's not my. I'm not obligated to. Okay. And if, if, if a publisher tries to tell me that I am, I mean, fuck them. What about you, Zoe? I, I kind of respect what you're doing because I think your work has your essence. Like it just has to contain part of you. No, I think that's a romantic view of it. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry, that's the question I was going to ask you. But sometimes, you know, you read a great book, you see the film, and you're so disappointed. And I've heard that Rowan Atkinson, apparently, in real life, is really boring. So mm -hmm. what if people build up this image of you through your book, and you're just a complete disappointment? It's really dangerous meeting writers you like, yeah. or anybody that you like. Especially for a writer to <laughs> meet a writer that he or she likes. Oh, because you're yeah. putting one part of yourself there when you appear in real life. You know, it could be, could be a great disappointment for people. can be. I've been very disappointed meeting some of my literary heroes, and very pleasantly surprised. Yeah, I suspect that anybody who meets me goes way disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh... I've noticed since I began doing that, Facebook has changed and now you have to pay to reach anybody. Yeah. I've built up thousands of followers and now my posts are getting to 100 people and that's okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now I'm wondering is it worth continuing with Facebook in your opinion or have you heard anything about the way it will continue to go? Or? The pay-per-view kind of model seems to be something that's around, and, and I occasionally pay to, to bump things up. Not always my own work, it's occasionally somebody else's or something I'm involved with. Uh, uh, but does even having a Facebook page with thousands of followers that all receive your messages, does that translate into sales, you know? Well, if, well, if you en My philosophy is if you enjoy it, and if it's not getting in the way of your writing, why not? Because you don't know what will work. So the more the more irons you have in the fire, that's mm. possibly a good thing. But but if it's getting if it's sucking your will to write, then yeah. you absolutely yeah. should stop. It's okay. interesting. I went to a social media and internet marketing course a few weeks ago, and this gentleman that runs runs the social media courses is an expert in it. He's just shut down his Facebook page for, because for his business, it doesn't. It's not pr productive. For him, um, he's doing his Twitter and his blog, his website. So I think you just have to work out how much time you're investing, mm -hmm. and whether it is actually maybe using Twitter to refer back to Facebook. So if people are interested, they then go if they're not getting the post because the pay per you know paying for posting is not going to change. It's just going to get more. Yeah, that's the money. Sorry, that's uh, yes, the writers that we hear. Uh, who were all published writers, and Helen Dunmore was one of them, and they all seem to intimate that they can see online uh, publication is going to really become a thing of the future. And one of the good things is that the authors get a lot more money that way. Well, can do. How do you how do you think that, that will the two exist, or will somehow pub, pub, publishers will get into the online thing and do their own thing again, or how do you see it going? I think there's a huge movement among writers in America right now to publish yourself. And mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a rejection of the new publishing model which expects you to write the book, do all the publicity, pay for it, all, all that kind of unfairness. And you know the opportunity is here to do it yourself. And of course it's hard. And it's hard especially if you don't have an audience already. You don't have like people who, a fan list or whatever people have contacted you in the past. Or just any kind of name recognition. But more and more people are doing it. So what they say that's, in America... That's what they were all saying. Yeah. And, and they I, were from you know, different countries and everything. My rule of thumb with technology, and I've heard this over and over, is like, you know, when the pen was invented, everybody said, oh my God, it's the death of the pencil. And the pencil is still around. Yeah. And the book will still be around 20 years from now and stuff. But this is a new format. And so it's exactly. just giving people more options. I think it's positive in that regard. Um, I do think, though, that... If you're going to do it yourself, you know, I don't know, it's a lot, a lot of work. And, it, and it's also really easy to do really bad. Yes, yeah. there's this danger yeah, of just messing it all up. Like if you, I don't know if you've ever, have you ever browsed the like, self-published section on Amazon? 
It's a scary place. There, there are, there are dark things there. I've seen things. <laughs> <laughs> you can't unsee. And they were also saying that, that it's sort of like a bit of an elite now. The people who have published and published look down on the writing that's well, online, is, and well, it's, it's less of that. Less, it's less um, of yeah. yeah well, it's, you, when, it's much more acceptable. Have I found what the that, publishing that, look down? The people that, that you're writing that's online. That, people sort of think, well, that's not as good Oh, not yes. so much anymore. No, 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 not so much anymore. I think, I, I'm not interested in doing it because I don't want to be a publisher and I'm not a very good marketing person. And I, I'm absolutely terrible at designing a good cover or telling whether a title is a good... I mean, I, this is why I want to be a traditionally published author mm-hmm. on the whole because, because I don't want to be those things. I just want to be a writer who occasionally says stuff on social media and goes to the odd festival. I'm not comfortable doing that. I'm not comfortable doing the rest. I also know that what's 100,000 new titles go online on Amazon every day or something ridiculous like that. I don't want to do the little hard legwork that, that Hugh, Hugh Howie did for ages to get Wall up into the bestseller list, which is responding to every single review, every single comment, every single comment. It's a huge, you know, it's a huge job, and I'm far too lazy. I would rather write four books a year and hope that one of them takes off. You know, that, That's my strategy. I think every writer works really hard and they find the way that's easiest and most enjoyable for them and for some it's self-publishing. However, publishers, like what they say now is that that self-published marketplace is the new slush pile. So. Yeah, and, yeah you're, you're, and you're seeing publishers, traditional publishers, wading into, this, into self-publishing with like a reduced, like an increased royalties, reduced editorial input type package that they're lifting out of, this, out of, out of self-published market. And we've had the first deal, was it the first deal, first big deal from a Harlequin author who sold only print book rights and kept the ebook rights for herself. This happened last week. So this is a potential game changing situation too. Yeah. Traditional publishing will only do print and authors will continue to sell electronically. Mm. That's Maybe. unusual. It is very unusual. It's the, the first big deal and literally I, last week. I, wow. still, and I also think that, that, <laughs> that the, 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 the story you hear of self published authors who suddenly make it big and are racking in six figure figures a month. Are that's a very tiny minority. Like of winning the lottery. Yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah. But I think it's actually good because I think this is good for self-published authors because they don't have to invest twenty thousand dollars on a a shed full of books that will never sell. Now they just got to spend thousand dollars on a on a ebook. So the lock potential loss is a lot lower, and I think mm-hmm. that that is a really positive thing. Uh, but you know, it's still a loss. I was just going to ask a question that not everyone who reads is reading published books. <laughs> People are reading more than they've ever read. They're reading blogs on Twitter and Facebook. And that is a way of creating readership. And I think of people like Margaret Atwood and even locally like Victoria Furman. And, yeah. You know, they, uh, there's a, as a reader, um, I'm, it's a great way of me um, influencing where I want some of the story to go, perhaps. And have you thought about it? Love interest for Barbara or something I'd suggested for Victoria in her next novel. Um, so there's that kind of relationship. Thing. But there's also, um, I think that, um, and Anita Heist is an Australian author and um, Margaret Atwood both say this, that uh, everything they write is writing. So whether it's a tweet or a Facebook or a blog or whatever. And I th- I'm really interested to hear what you think about that because I think of myself in that way. And I don't know that um, people who are running novels would think like that, so I'm really interested in what you might say to that comment. That everything you write is writing. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and then for the media that you, the platform that you do, it's also creating readers. Right. Potential. Sure. Not yeah. the reading of tweet, the reading. I think even when I sell, send like angry emails to tenants, I'm using a voice that I've crafted. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. But do you take the hat off when you do that? I send a photo of myself. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> In a first yeah, scowling. Yeah. <laughs> so. I think that is a good question, and I think um, there are opportunities for writers to explore new ways of putting themselves out, not just through social media. I mean. For my new series, I, for the first time ever, created a website devoted just to that series. And on that website, I'm doing blog posts, I'm posting reviews, but I'm also posting new fiction. So, yeah. again, for the first time ever, I'm writing quite short fiction, 500 to 1,500 words that I'm putting on there for free, or giving to bloggers for free, yeah. that connect to the series. And I'm finding that really rewarding. I'm finding that, as a writer, 
a really interesting way to engage with my own craft. And, it, and it's, it's self-publishing. I'm not charging for it. It's just for free. It may be an immense wank, but I'm enjoying it. And I noticed that... Uh, I, I never look at stats for hits on my site, but I noticed that when I post one of these pieces of fiction, the spam goes through the roof. So the spam bots are noticing something. So I'm taking that as a good sign. Yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah that's the same with um, Elizabeth Knox, who I was talking to today. Yeah. And um, Elizabeth doesn't do a lot of the social media, but she has a, um, a website. Mm. And she posts short stories that sort of are almost like a thought that was in that novel but didn't make it into mm, that novel, yeah, yeah. that she'll write a story over here and then she'll just post that story. And so there's yeah. some really interesting stuff that sort of... It's almost the bits that didn't quite make it in, but it took her somewhere else, mm. so or backstory or whatever, and that's really really interesting to yeah. to read to sort of so, which is I guess for myself, you know I, I don't do a lot of Twitter and Facebook and that sort of stuff, I mean, but I do actually if I um, am researching a writer or if I want to find out what the writer's doing, I will go to their website. So the website is still, for me, somewhere I'd go and find out a bit about them, see what other books that they've published, or see see what they're writing about. And I find that that ability to put a bit here and a bit there, it's a bit like, you know, oh, here's a little present for you for coming to... I find that much more interesting than the Twitter feeds. Don't you like that too, with essays? Philosophy and poetry, but you'll often do a little essay on a topic that is written five poems about, and then you get to read the essay, you know, you feed because it's been uploaded, and you just think, oh, what a lovely treat! I must go and buy that piece of book of poetry I've been meaning to do. Fingers crossed, that's what's happening, you know. Right. uh, Well, of course, you know, um, we are here in Adelaide Writers' Week, and um, I mean, the Writers' Week has been going for a very long time, and that, that was basically set up to connect readers with the writers and to create more readers. It was so set up to connect writers with writers. The original brief oh, was to story. bring writers to Adelaide so Adelaide writers could be part of the global national yeah. community. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, that's <laughs> right. That's, um, so, oh, you're on. I'm on the committee. So, um, <laughs> so, but it's quite interesting because, um, I mean, I'm assuming that you're all sort of going to at least something in Writers Week, but big assumption, but still, I will always discover a writer that I haven't read before mm. at Writers Week mm. and it might be for the fact that you know I might only hear five minutes of them speak or something or it might be at the book tent or whatever but it is a really interesting way of creating readers and especially when you're meeting other people that are going to sessions so there's sort of like it's like you know those ripples in the pond mm. somebody says oh did you see such and such talk about that and you go oh no think their book the next time you go in so do you find, I mean, I, I'm sort of interested in that translation from what you're doing here. I mean, you're both here in Australia. How does that translate for you through your publishers to your book sales? So, I feel like every... You won't ever know. I <laughs> <laughs> but I guess if it didn't translate, your publisher or your publicist would stop sending you, would they not? I think it's, a, I don't know, it's a, it's a long game, right? Like, like, mm-hmm. like I mean, let's be I'm not selling thousands of copies of Ballistics. Yeah. Right, but I, but I am, you know, people need to hear your name six times or something like that before yes. before it registers. So you know, it's just it's a long game. So they're they're thinking down down the road, and also it's, it doesn't go away like, usually for a long time. So you know, I, I, you know, I'm still getting I'm still making sales on one Knuckle knockout came two years ago, right? So it's it's you know, in eight years when I have two more books out, so I have a, so I'll have four books out. And it's just that it just keeps going, right? It's not you don't it doesn't really it doesn't do this. It could build slowly. So I, I think it's not quite as disappointing for a publisher. I could be wrong. I think I think that I have it. Maybe I've lucked out with my publishers, um, it, but it's not as disappointing for them if if you don't if you go to these things and you don't see a big bump in sales yeah. or a big bump in yeah. in readership. The only I mean the only time I I know because like they just told me I don't know why they did it that I, how many that I sold a bunch was when they put one two break and knuckle on Amazon for a day for ninety nine cents and I sold two thousand copies. And then, and then what happened is that the rating dropped because it was suddenly people were all by that, and it was like, and it was people who didn't want to read it, read it, hated it, one star. So suddenly, that's that. That's the only time I have seen like an actual like cause and effect to to readership, and it was no good to me. I didn't even see any money off of that because you don't you don't get your normal royalties off a ninety nine cent book. 
Um, every book I've ever read as a reader that I've loved or that is exciting in that way comes from recommendation from somebody. And it doesn't even have to be somebody I trust, just somebody who's capable of convincing me that this was a great book and I want to experiment and try it myself. And I think that that is something that publishers can never control and like it just sort of fundamentally just pisses them off or something. <laughs> like, But they're going to try so hard and they're going to ask you to try so hard and yet what really the bottom line of selling books is, is uh, word of mouth and really just... Yep. something communicated personally on a really non-internet way and sometimes it can be it can be not even about the book and I, and I, I, I totally understand your feeling that the book is the thing and that you are this irrelevant appendage that's kind of carrying it around <laughs> uh, and I totally feel that way about my books too but I also know that when I when I approach books the author can have a huge influence on whether I buy it or not like um who wrote Ender's Game, Orson Scott Card. I will never buy an Orson Scott Card book because he is a right-wing homophobic dickhead. I will never, ever <laughs> buy a book by him. No matter how brilliant they are, I will never buy a book by him. Uh, so it's a moral standpoint. It's a moral yeah. standpoint. Yeah. And, there, and, and sometimes you can meet an author who's horrible, horrible to you personally, and you, I will never buy a book by this book. But sometimes you might meet somebody at Writers Week who's really nice and really interesting and really friendly, and even though... You'd never normally read a book like that. You might buy it just to try it, and you might love it, and you might not like it. But you've still bought the book, you know. <laughs> so, it's, it's, personality still plays a role, and and putting yourself out there and being engaging, being friendly, being professional uh, helps spread that word of mouth because people might like you. And you don't you don't do it cynically. You don't yeah. suck up to people to hope to get the word of mouth going. But the more you kind of spread yourself around in whatever media or environment, just increases that chance that you might get some word of mouth going. And do you think yeah. that um, in terms of, you know, just talking about the set of writers, the writers connecting to writers, and there used to be, but there used to be lots of residentials, there was all sorts of things that went alongside writers' work for many years. Does that still happen? Is that still one of the promised values of coming to Writers' Week in Adelaide, that connection between other, you and other writers? I don't know about you guys, but I think going to oh, any, not, any festival, the best, yeah. one of the best things about it is meeting other writers. That's, That's totally why. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and so things do you recommend each other's books? <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I discovered Elizabeth Knox yep. through coming here, and it was actually from sitting on a bus next to her, and Marcus Chow was sitting next to her, and he was like, I can't believe I'm yeah. meeting you, oh my god, he was so excited, and... It, it's funny because I don't know that just having a conversation with him he would have recommended her book but just that she was there and, and then I'm online and I'm like who's this person you know and then I read the wiki page about what her books are about and I was like this sounds brilliant and amazing I splashed out $30 which is unbelievable I, was yeah. like, I got on Amazon in America and it's $5 yeah. and I was like I want it now it looks so incredible I splashed out for it went to her talk today that you gave with her it's that it's really common at a writer's conference, that kind of like serendipity like or something that you would never have heard of otherwise. There's too much junk out there. Yeah. I guess that's, and that's hard. For, for a reader, that's one of the things that I do go, and I do go because I want to discover the new, mm. the person I haven't read yet. So. Yeah. yeah. So, um, Just um, wondering about the word of mouth that you're talking about and the changing world of workshops. Oh, oh, of oh, oh yeah. So, do booksellers in real books still have their books? Because in days gone by, they did. Does that still happen a lot? On a personal level, yes, definitely. Like that's where I get book recommendations. That's who I talk to. Um, one of the people, you know. But um, I don't know. I think so. I mean, I think so. I I don't really know, um, but I do know that like the presence of giant book chains in England and Canada and the US is a very dangerous and damaging thing to the market, especially if those books, if those individual chains don't have autonomy to mm -hmm. stock the books that they want. Mm -hmm. Waterstones in the UK almost went under because of that very thing. Mm -hmm. And then finally they hired in the guy who founded one of the biggest independent bookstores in England, uh, James Daunt. They hired him to save them. And he, the first thing he did was decentralize. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so you have different, yeah. yeah. And I, I, so I, I mean, I, I think for sure brick and mortar bookshops do. Um, I think unfortunately what a lot of people do is go into those bookshops 
get recommendations, then go right back to Amazon. Buy yeah. them cheaper somewhere yeah. else. Yeah. yeah. Never. That's if you can help it, don't buy books on Amazon. That's a rule. I've yeah. seen my yeah. wife do that. That's awful. That's awful. That's awful. We are about to wrap up. So, any burning questions? If not, have we scared you off? Have we <laughs> convinced you to get a Twitter um, account? Can we convince you to cancel our Twitter account? <laughs> Writers Week, and I uh, hope you discover some new authors. And there's three brilliant authors who have read their work. Please go and buy them, they're in the bookshop next to the Writers Week team. Great, great, great. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I got everyone I do at Bentworth, I get them to sign my reading copy. Oh, cool.